Right, good evening, everybody. It's been a long time coming and we are here again. I'm just going to check that we're live on Facebook from my phone and you are in, yep, we are in for a good time today. So I'm just gonna wait for people to, to come on the stream. All right, happy Easter everybody who's watching, wherever you're watching from. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are watching from. It's evening where we are in the United Kingdom, and I have a very special guest today. Um, so to everyone who's watching, please quickly um, send a shout to everyone. I know we've not had our Monday shows for the past four months, but we're back on now. So Mondays are for growth, Mondays are for learning. And we're, we're back on again to come start learning together here on Monday. So wherever you are, please say hello. Um, and you know how we do, we start with gratitude. What are you grateful for? Um, resurrection, resurrection weekend. So much to be grateful for. So much to be grateful for resurrection weekend. So, okay. Um, so, Hey, I wrote just someone is saying, I can't see who it is. Uh, good evening, Coach Harold. Good evening, Roger. Right. Hi, good evening, everyone. Right. Nice to meet you. All right. What are you grateful for? Who's watching? Let us know where you're watching from and just tell us what you are grateful for. We're going to have an explosive conversation around leadership. Leadership is one of those things that will be around irrespective of COVID, irrespective of the new world. <laughs> You would always always be needing leaders. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Yes, um, AI is not about to take leadership. <laughs> so it's time for us to start growing in our leadership. So for everyone who's watching, I appreciate you being here. It's been a long time. We've been on the Monday on the Monday conversations, but we're back on, and we always start with with gratitude. Okay, someone is grateful for resurrection. Yep. I love Resurrection Weekend for so many reasons. Um, this this season reminds me a lot of a great and awesome miracle God did in my life and family in the last um, 11 years ago. And it was the miracle of resurrection in itself. All right, thank you for reminding us. Grateful for resurrection. Who else is here? Who else is here? Um, tell everybody to get to hop on, let everybody hop on and let's start with gratitude. Who else is grateful? as we get our Monday shows back on. We've been away for four months and we're back on every Monday, 7.30. I'm gonna have one of my guests and we're gonna be learning something new. And my guest today is Roger Fairhead. Um, Roger Fairhead. Um, I don't know if anybody knows about the, all right. Um, we've got Mr. Mayo, how are you doing, sir? He's grateful for life and resurrection. Grateful Amen. for life and resurrection. Yep, Resurrection Weekend, we're grateful for life and resurrection. All right, who else is grateful? I'm gonna introduce my guest to you all in a second. I was actually just practicing. Um, Roger, I was actually just practicing not calling you Richard. <laughs> <laughs> always, I have the habit of always calling him Richard. <laughs> so I've got this other mentor uh, who, who's Richard. <laughs> so I tend to always call, <laughs> I tend to call Roger Richard, but yeah. Roger Fairhead is here today, and we're going to have a great conversation around leadership. All right, I'm just waiting for a few more people to get on the stream. Um, people need to get used to seeing me back here on Mondays. Um, the last few Mondays I've been off, um, and here we're back. We're back on to come learn, and we're starting with leadership. Um, someone is grateful for Roger Fairhead and Aaron Tiaron. Thank you very much, sir. I think I know who they are. I've just seen who it is. Thank you very much, sir. Um, all right, we're just waiting for more people. And in the next five minutes or so, I will introduce my guest who's gonna take us through a teaching on prize, prized um, leadership, prize winning leadership. And he's gonna tell us what that is all about. Um, actually has a book on prize winning leadership. Every time you get an opportunity to learn when it comes to leadership, guys, you need to always take that opportunity. There's always something we can learn when it comes to leadership. And I am so honored today that we have someone um, who's gonna be taking us, leading us in on that conversation today. So I'm just waiting for my people um, to get in on the stream. Um, 
and we would get going waiting for our people to get in on the <laughs> get in on the stream and we'll get going um do you, do you want to tell us a bit about uh before i introduce so um richard in 2020 was actually appointed as the ceo of the global leadership network um uk and ireland do you want to do you want to tell us a bit about the global leadership network while we're waiting for people um before i do a proper introduction and get you to teach over to you richard roger, yes roger roger roger, roger, roger. <laughs> i went richard again <laughs> roger. i think i need to change my name by deep pole don't i that'll, that'll yeah, I mean, like just that. <laughs> that's like we we're talking before before we started you probably now need to start answering roger richard <laughs> all right roger tell us a bit about the global leadership network the global and, leadership network what is it it's the global leadership network is a network of uh, where, that holds an annual conference. Now, we hold a, an annual conference in Chicago every year. Well, this last year was a little bit different for reasons that will become pretty obvious in a moment. But normally, we'd have a conference, a leadership conference, in uh, Willow Creek Church in, uh, in Barrington, um, uh, Chicago, Illinois. Uh, the campus holds around 10,000 people. So we'd normally have 10,000 people on site at a live conference over, over two days for world-class speak teaching on leadership from from world-class speakers this last year we had one a recent u.s president we've had Condoleezza rice we've had uh, jim collins we've had uh, uh, craig Richelle, we've had we've had john maxwell a lot of really awesome speakers speak sharing their, their wisdom with us and uh, what we then do normally we tell we bring that that conference material back to the uk and then we share that in conferences again in-person conferences live conferences around the uk between 15 and 25 conferences um attracting between two and five thousand people depending upon uh, on, uh, over over the years this last year of course we did it slightly differently <laughs> for obvious reasons we weren't able to hold the live conference in chicago and we weren't able to hold the live in-person events here in, across the uk so back around this time last year we we made the decision to go digital first. I believe one of the things that is really important in leadership is to bring certainty into a world that is full of uncertainty. And mm. what we knew for certain, what we knew for certain was that we could bring a digital event. So we decided to change tracks. We decided to jump onto the digital route um, and, and to bring the, the content to the UK digitally. And we've done that so far. We've put on about uh, what about 11 conferences across since october november through to uh, february march um the most recent one was just uh fr fr a couple of fridays ago we've got yep. some more conferences coming up in may and i can tell you more about that later but with the the idea is to bring this teaching to the people in the uk so we can just share the content but more than that we don't just want to share content. There's a, there's a wealth of content coming our way, isn't there? It's almost like an all-you-can-eat buffet, and stuff just keeps yeah. coming. Uh, and you can end up with indigestion. So what we what we do is we select the content, and then we, we intentionally spend time together in small groups processing that content. And that, with each event coming out with something actionable that we're gonna we're gonna commit to doing differently. We're all about making making measurable change. To ignite it and to ignite transformation. So that's pretty much what the Global Leadership Network does. Good stuff. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. I, I mean, you haven't even started talking, and you're <laughs> you're, you're dropping nuggets already. Leadership brings certainty in a world full of uncertainty. You know, I mean, we're not going to get into this. I tell, I, I I run a leadership academy, and I was telling them last month's session that leaders are actually created for uncertainty. It's we bring clarity to uncertain situation a leader typically would not necessarily have the clue but that's why we're leaders such that we can bring clarity and lead effectively so great we're going to have a great conversation around leadership um i i, I think i want to start taking notes so everybody please make um the 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 ceo of the global leadership network uk and ireland um mr roger fairhead we met a few years in florida and we've been able to stay connected um doing a great work with the global leadership um, um network here in the uk and ireland of which i am i am a part of that and the great things that that are going ahead with the global leadership academy um global leadership network uk and ireland which roger will probably share 
a few more of the of the great initiatives that we're coming up with this year so Roger graduated from the Labro University, started his career in managing engineering projects. In 2002, started his consulting business with a focus on speaking training and coaching on leadership. And most recently, um, he published his first book on prize winning leadership, um, which pretty much, yeah, that's the book there, which pretty much describes the methodology that he uses with um, the, the companies and clients that he works with all around the world. And just like you heard last year, um, as a result of the work he does in leadership globally, especially with the Global Leadership Network, he was now appointed the CEO of the Global Leadership Network, UK and Ireland. Um, Roger Fairhead, thank God I'm not calling you Richard this time around. <laughs> um, welcome to the Thrivers Group. Um, the people here on Thrivers Group love to learn. And I mean, someone just said um, pen and ready, pen, pen and notes, pen ready for notes. Yeah, we love to learn. I'm gonna get out of your screen and just give you another 30, 40 minutes to teach us on this concept of prize winning leadership. And we'll come back and have a QA and a session. Over to you, Rook. Fantastic, thanks, Aaron. And thank you everybody for joining us here today. Do you know where you're going to? Do you like the things that life is showing you? Where are you going to? Do you know? Well, those lyrics were sung by Diana Ross, originally sung by Diana Ross as the theme tune to a film called Mahogany that was released back in the mid 1970s. And it was, and it's, and it, the, 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 the tune is one of my all time favorite tunes for a reason I'm gonna come back to in a moment. Mahogany was a film all about a young girl called Tracy Chambers who grew up in a really poor neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. Now, Tracy had a dream and her dream was to escape from her life of poverty by becoming a successful fashion designer. And her dream inspired her to do everything she possibly could to pursue that dream and find ways to make it become a reality. Now, along the way, Tracy was spotted by a top fashion designer, a chap called Sean McAvoy. And Sean invited Tracy to join him at the fashion capital of the world on the catwalks in Rome. Well, it didn't take long for Tracy to become Sean's top fashion model. And so he gave her a stage name and her stage name, the stage name he cho chose for Tracy was Mahogany, hence the title of the film, of course. Not long after that, Tracy had established her own fashion design house and she was modeling her own designs and selling them to the rich and famous. Tracy's dream had become a reality. So let's think about this for a moment. How can your dream become a reality? Well, this is where prize winning leadership comes in. The first essential element of prize winning leadership is called imagine. And it's all about imagining your dream in such a way that it inspires you to pursue that dream and find ways to make it become a reality. So in the words of Diana Ross, do you know where you're going to? Do you like the things that life is showing you? Where are you going to? Do you know? Well, whenever I listen to music, I like to listen to the bass line first. And that song has got an awesome bass line running all the way right through it. If you know, if you know the song, you know that you know the bass line that I mean. It, it's been a, it's been a childhood dream of mine to play bass guitar in a band. After after all, it's all about the it's all about the bass, no treble. So when a friend of mine said to me, Roger, how would you like to to play bass guitar in my band? Well, I jumped at the chance. I got an old bass guitar and a cheap combo amp, and I'd even played in a few gigs some 10 years before that. Now, it wasn't until I got a hold of the music and started practicing that I remembered something that was really rather, rather important. They don't use music on stage. Not only was I going to have to learn the pieces, I was going to have to memorize them if I wanted to perform on stage with the band. Now, some people have got really, really good memories. Do you know those kind of people that can remember names and faces? They can remember everybody's spouse's name, everybody's children's names. They can remember where they last went on holiday. Unfortunately, I'm not one of them. In fact, in its place, I've got a really good forgettery. <laughs> and what's more, it's getting better with age. In, in fact, if there's anything you need forgetting, just let me know and I'll make sure to forget it for you. So for a while, I wrestled with the notion that I'd have to abandon any idea of playing bass guitar on stage with a band. But my passion for music and my eagerness to play bass inspired me to push through 
and to confront those those inner voices. Have you ever heard those inner voices that say, what do you think you're doing? What kind of idiot are you? What do you think you're trying to do? You're going to be stood on stage with nothing to play. People are going to laugh at you. It's going to be embarrassing. You know that. In fact, I can remember on one of my first outings, one of my first gigs, someone in the audience asked the sound crew to turn the bass guitar up because they couldn't quite hear it, only to be told, I don't think he's actually playing anything at the moment. Well, I persevered and I managed to find ways to help me remember my part. And I carried on playing in that band for many, many years afterwards. My childhood dream of playing bass guitar in a band had become a reality. So, do you know where you're going to? Well, to help you find an answer to that, I'd like to ask you two questions. Normally, when I start work with a new client, I ask them two questions. What's the difference you want to make? And what makes you different? What's the difference you want to make? And what makes you different? Now, you may have heard of the, the, the story of a, of a couple of builders on a building site, and they were asked what they were doing. The first builder said, well, I'm digging a ditch. Of course, I'm digging a ditch just to earn a living. The other builder said, I'm building a cathedral. You may have heard the story about a janitor who was asked, what was he doing? He, he said, I'm, I'm mopping the floors to earn a living. The other janitor, he said, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. They were working at NASA, of course. What's, what's the difference you want to make and what makes you different? For me, what's the difference I want to make? What makes me different? I want to help difference makers make a difference. That's the strap line to my business, prize winning leadership, helping difference makers make a difference. What's the difference you want to make and what makes you different? You might want to just jot some, some ideas into chat as we're talking and as we're sharing together. What's the difference you want to make and what makes you different? Well, for me, the prize winning leadership model is what makes me different and working with difference makers. I'll come on to what makes a difference maker in a moment, but here's the prize winning leadership model. It starts off with imagine, we've, we've talked about that already. It goes on to talk about influence and we're gonna come on to that in just a moment. It then moves on to look at interacting with people. It looks at implementing your dream. It looks about how do you increase to get ready for the next level of your vision. And it looks at inspiration. Inspiration runs right through the heart of everything we do in prize winning leadership. So what makes you different? What, what makes you different for me? It's difference makers, working with difference makers, helping difference makers make a difference. What's a difference maker? Well, we can talk about that a bit later in the Q&A if you'd like. But in essence, a difference maker is somebody who is working on a, on a, in a business that is not just for profit. Now, we have the, the old concept of for profit and not for profit companies. I'd like to move the move the boundaries and say we have for profit companies and not just for profit companies. So just for profit companies and not just for profit companies. And I like to work with not just for profit companies. These are people I call difference makers. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, I, be, I was last year I was appointed to be chief executive of the Global Leadership Network. So what does the Global Leadership? What makes them different? Well, the Global Leadership Network. We've, we feature world-class speakers, speakers of the absolute top quality. We focus on facilitated process time, making sure we, we make space for people to engage with the content and really let it settle in to discuss it with other people. And thirdly, to look at measurable change. What's measurable change? What's measurable about the change that we're going to make? And let's move forward one step at a time, making individual steps so that we can ignite transformation. So what's the difference you want to make and what makes you different? Well, when I was growing up, I wanted to become an engineer <laughs> and much of my early career was spent managing engineering projects. Now, the thing about engineers, I don't know if there's any engineers in the room, but the thing about engineers, I am one, I graduated in engineering. Uh, the thing about engineers is that we're really, really good with things. We're good at designing things, creating things, building things, fixing things. 
engineers are the sort of people you're going to turn to first if your washing machine's broken or your computer doesn't work. One of the things I found as a project manager, though, is that engineers are really, really good with things, but they're not very good with people, like many professionals. They're really good with things, but not very good with people. What I found was that you can manage things, but you need to lead people. You can manage things, but you need to lead people. I discovered that a key differentiator between success and failure in projects, in business, in life, had to do with effective leadership skills, with leading people well. Because if you lead people well, you can inspire them to want to do what they're doing. You can turn have to into want to, and then they'll inspire themselves to be great. So how would you define leadership? How do you define leadership? Well, one definition of leadership is that lead is, is leadership is about taking people from here to there. After all, if there's no there to go to, why bother leaving here? Another definition of leadership is about taking people with you from here to there. After all, as John Maxwell says, a leader with no followers is simply taking a walk. A very popular definition, a very succinct, a very straightforward, easy to remember definition is that leadership is influence. However, I'd say that that's an incomplete definition. It's helpful as a shortcut, but it's incomplete. I would say that leadership is intentional influence it's something you do intentionally it doesn't just happen by chance but there's a still something missing there's still something missing from that definition and i would say that leadership is intentional influence in the context of relationship intentional influence in the context of relationship so Influence. The word influence, um, the influence can be used for good purposes or for bad purposes. It can be used for honourable outcomes or dishonourable outcomes. However, the sort of influence that we're talking about as difference makers who want to make a difference is genuine ethical influence. And that starts with integrity. Genuine ethical influence starts with integrity. Now, the word integrity that comes from the same root word as the word integer, apparently. And an integer, of course, means a number that's whole and complete. So, so one definition of integrity could be that our words and our actions are whole and complete. They say the same thing. Another definition of integrity could mean it's, 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 it's not doing those things that you don't want to see on tomorrow morning's newspapers or tonight's evening news or in social media in the next five minutes. But I think it goes further than that. I think integrity means doing the right thing even when no one will notice. Let me take you back to a time when I learned a really important lesson on integrity. When I was a kid growing up, I used to hang around with a bunch of mates. And one day during the summer holidays, we were, we were just messing about and two of the lads disappeared. Well, the rest of us decided we were going to find out where they got. And we finally caught up with them. They were in our local park. They were hiding in some bushes, having a smoke. Now, we were all of us of an age where we were, we were about to move up to high school. We were feeling quite big and important at the top of our junior school. We were about to move up to high school. And we were feeling quite grown up, really. And smoking seemed to be quite a grown-up thing to do, so we decided to join in. Do you know, I can remember we used to take in turns to buy a packet of 20 from a vending machine outside of our local corner shop. It used to cost half a crown a pack, <laughs> and you'd get change wrapped inside the cellophane wrapping. I don't know if anybody of you can remember the uh, getting change that way in a packet of cigarettes. Anyway, anyway, on the way home, all of a sudden, I had this awful thought. What if mum finds out? And what if she tells dad? But then I had this absolutely brilliant idea. <laughs> a, a, a brilliant idea. What I did is I cupped my hands, blew into them, and then breathed in deeply to see if I could smell anything. No, 
no, I think I'm going to be all right. I don't, th I think I'm going to get away with it. Well, of course, <laughs> I didn't get away with it at all. As any non-smoker will tell you, they can usually detect the slightest trace of smoke on a smoker for hours afterwards. It's a bit like that when you compromise your integrity. You may be able to get away with it for a little while, but it leaves a trace that others are going to be able to figure out sooner or later. Now, the thing about integrity is that we're not born with it or, or without it, as it happens, which means that it's a behavior based trait that we can cultivate over time. We can set ourselves the goal to show more integrity in everyday life and we can work towards that goal by practicing. So genuine ethical influence starts with integrity and integrity leads to the sort of influence that makes a difference. Well, as a leader, you are an influencer. You have some ideas and thoughts and plans you want to share with your team. And presumably you want your team to do something differently as a result of hearing your ideas, don't you? Well, my, my point today is simply this, that as a leader, you are an influencer. If people do something differently as a result of hearing your, your ideas and thoughts. Now, the thing is, as much as you might want to, you can't change people's behavior simply by trying to change their behavior. And that's because our behavior is based on our attitudes and emotions, which are based on our values, which are based on our beliefs. So if you can't change people's behavior by trying to change their behavior, how do you go about influencing your team in such a way that they do change their behavior, do something different and turn shelf development into self-development? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> it's widely known that we all tend to make our decisions based on our emotions and then justify those decisions with logic. We make our decisions based on our emotions and justify those decisions with logic. It's certainly true about buying things, but it's also true about buying ideas such as the ideas that you'll be sharing with your team, your team next week. And it's the stories that you use to, to share those ideas that connect with the emotions. So here's a little story for you. Some years ago, I used to teach violin as a peripatetic music teacher at a local, local private school. Now, one of my students was a young girl called Steph. She was in year 11 and she was studying for her grade five. Now, Steph, was absolutely passionate about practicing the pieces that she, she was going to be playing for her next examination. In fact, she had little time for anything else at all. It, it turns out that she was simply on a mission to maximize her UCAS points. She wanted to learn the tunes to pass the test, but didn't really want to learn the techniques necessary. Now, the thing about playing the violin is it's not just about playing the right notes. <laughs> Though, of course, that, that, that obviously helps quite a lot. It's, it's not just about playing the right notes. My violin teacher was a rather short, slim, elderly lady called Mrs. Vera K. Stubbington. And she took me aside in one of my lessons and she said, Roger, it's not just about playing the right notes. It's about feeling the music. Mrs. Stubbington taught me all the usual scales and arpeggios and things like that. But she also used some studies and exercises to help me to, 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 to teach me all the techniques that a violinist needs to learn to use. Techniques such as, such as double stopping, which is when you play notes on two different strings at the same time. Or, or spiccato, which is when you get the bow bouncing on the string by playing very fast, tight, intricate tunes. Or, or, um, or, or a forced harmonics, which is when you stop the string with your first finger and then rest the fourth finger very gently on the string to create a note two octaves higher. She then had me learn some pieces that use these techniques. One of the, in fact, one of my favorite, my all time favorite pieces was a piece called, it was a Hungarian gypsy dance called Chardash written by uh, an Italian composer called Vittorio Monti back in 1905 or thereabouts. If you know the tune, then you'll know that it's a really flamboyant piece, one that's used by a lot of soloists as, as a really flamboyant um, uh, piece, piece for them to, to show off with. It's got some fantastic but challenging techniques built right into it. 
And it's one that I used to practice rather a lot between lessons when I was teaching. You see, between students, I had little else to do. So I used to take along some pieces from my solo repertoire and practice those. My standard of playing improved immensely around that time. In fact, so much so that I got invited to start playing uh, electric violin in a band. It was my job to play all the harmonies and then to swing the tune a little and add some improvisation from here from time to time. I have to say that musically speaking, that was probably one of the most exciting and enjoyable experiences that I've been lucky enough to be involved with. Mrs. Stubbington gave me a musical education, not just a qualification. Uh, recently, I've been booked to play in some really special weddings. My niece and nephew are getting married. Uh, not to each other, though, not to each other. They, they've managed to find themselves a spouse each. You'll be happy to hear. When I started practicing the piece, I got the music and started practicing the pieces. My wife, Sue, said to me, Roger, that sounds really mechanical. No one who knows those pieces is ever going to be able to like, sing along to those. So then I had to figure out how to swing the tune a little so people could sing along if they wanted to. The notes are necessary, but it's the feel that's important. Steph played the notes, but without any real feeling. She wanted the qualification, not the education. If we want to influence our audience to do something differently, we need to feel the music to connect with them emotionally. So they'll want to sing along with us. Well, every point needs a story and every story needs a point. And the point of that story is that we need to be able to feel the music to connect with our audience emotionally. So why is that important? Well, as a, as a leader, we're not here to try and change people's behavior directly because, because we know we can't do that. We, 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 rather, we need to connect with the attitudes and emotions that cause their behavior. After all, our behavior is simply the manifestation of what's going on underneath. So we need to really understand our team and find a way to connect, find some common ground with their attitudes and emotions and beliefs and make a connection with them right there. Here's a splendid example of how important it is to make a connection, to, to connect with your, 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 your team emotionally, and in this case, an audience emotionally, and one that makes all the difference, made all the difference between success and failure for these performers. Recently, Sue, my wife and I, we were watching an episode of The Voice on TV. It was a Saturday evening on a cold winter's night, and we were just settling down for an evening of entertainment in front of a nice warm coal fire. Well, for those of you who know the show, you'll know there are, um, there are, there are four judges and that the opening rounds are called the blind auditions. Now, in this stage, what happens is that the judges, the judges' chairs are facing away from the, from the performers, so they have to make their, their, their judgment based on what they can hear and not what they can see. Now, if one of the judges likes what they hear, they have this buzzer, they hit the buzzer, the lights go off everywhere, the chair spins around, and they can see the rest of the performance. If none of the, if none of the judges hit their buzzer, then the judge is the, the 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 act is just sent away. But if more than one judge hits their buzzer, then the 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 uh, the performer gets to choose who they're going to work with. This particular evening, there were some fantastic sounding singers, for whom the judges didn't turn, and there were some seemingly less accomplished singers, for whom they did turn. The judges seem to be listening out for more than just the tune. And it turns out they were listening out for those performers who could really feel the music and with whom they could feel an emotional connection. Here, of course, the judges included that the audience included those primarily included those four judges and their views were all that counted. Now, every every point needs a story and every story needs a point. But if we want our audience to do something differently, They'll need, to, they'll need something more. They'll need to know how to apply what they've learned. So here's a little story about applying something that I learned. When I started playing bass guitar regularly, some of my bass playing friends gave me some advice. They said, Roger, you need to remember 
three things. You need to remember to sync with the kick drum, keep it simple, and stay on the beat. Sync with the kick drum, keep it simple, and stay on the beat. So I worked really, really hard to listening out for the kick drum so I could stay in, in sync with that, whatever the beat that the, the drummer was, was picking out. Keeping my part nice and simple, <laughs> you know, less is more. And staying right on the beat. Well, before long, we started practicing some new pieces, and one of them had an absolutely awesome bass line in it, a really gorgeous bass line in it. It's the sort of bass line that gets the neck moving. Do you know those sort of bass lines where, you, where your drummers are moving? <laughs> it's just awesome. I just loved it. And in fact, as I started to get the hang of it, I could, I really, I could really feel the groove. And I found myself playing in the pocket. Well, actually, to be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure whose pocket I was in, but that's how my muso mates described it anyway. Anyway, we, we, we soon, before long, we got together and we started to practice the, the, this new piece together. And I was just loving it. I was there. I was Mr. Bass Player. I was on top of Cloud Nine. I was in the groove. I was just feeling that, feeling the. And then I looked across to see the bass player, give me the, the drummer, give me a right old glare. I'd fallen off the beat, hadn't I? So now I had to figure out how to feel the groove and stay right on the beat, both at the same time. Well, the solution was had to do with tapping my foot. It's a technique I learned for it's a fact. It, can, can you imagine it, 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 with from having spent years in orchestras where it's uh, it's frowned upon <laughs> to tap your foot? Can you imagine watching an orchestra, so the, the the London Symphony Orchestra at the Barbican, or, or the the BBC Symphony Orchestra on the last night of the Proms, and all the first violins are there tapping their feet, it had slightly out of time with each other. It would look awful. And anyway, it's not allowed. <laughs> You're supposed to be watching the conductor for your timing. Apparently, with bass guitar. It's actually encouraged. It's, it's a technique I learned from a fabulous place called scottsbasslessons.com. It's online, scottsbasslessons.com. I'd recommend you go there. If you know anybody who wants to improve their bass playing skills, a great place for some fabulous tutorials. And this particular tutorial, this particular exercise, was really, really helpful in, in figuring out how to feel the groove and stay right on the beat both at the same time. What's more, it's a really simple technique too. It's tap your heel, not your toe. You try it next time you're listening to some music and you'll find it makes your whole body start to move in sync with the music. Now, my behavior had changed forever because my attitude had changed and I'd applied what I'd learned. Now I was able to feel the groove and stay right on the beat simply by tapping my foot. In, in your leadership, are you able to feel the music, just as I need to feel the groove and stay on the beat whilst playing the playing bass guitar, or swing the tune and have some improvisation when playing the violin? Or are you gonna be just like Steph, who simply wanted to play the notes? Oh, and Steph failed at grade five, by the way. We don't want to fail our audience. We want to feel the groove and stay on the beat. We want to swing the tune and add some improvisation. We want to connect with our audience emotionally so that they'll want to buy into our ideas. Well, let's go back to my dear old violin, my music, dear old violin teacher, Mrs. Vera K. Stubbington, and her front parlor where she gave lessons. And of course, Mrs. Stubbington had a cat called Felix. Now, not many people know that cats can feel the music too, but they can. Uh, when I was having violin lessons, my progress in learning a tune and getting a feel for the music was measured in cat minutes. <laughs> Let me explain. Um, when I started learning a new tune and got the music out, Felix would be out of there right away. He'd, he'd march out of the room, his tail in the air, looking over his shoulder as if to say, what on earth do you call that? <laughs> then as I started to get a feel for the music and started playing and started getting practicing a little bit more, he might stay in the room a little bit longer. And I can remember the very first time that Mrs. Stubbington came out of my lesson at the end and spoke to my mum, who was in the waiting room, and she said, 
Roger played really well today. Felix stayed in the room right through to the end of his lesson. Well, it's not so easy to see when an online audience is staying in the room with you. And so now it's even more important to feel the music and connect with your audience emotionally. So they'll want to stay in the room and sing along with you. Now, they may be like Felix and they can't hold a tune so well. It's well known that the cats can't hold a tune. In fact, if you've ever heard the musical cats, then you'll know exactly what I mean. But Felix could certainly feel the music and he'd let you know in no uncertain terms when he couldn't. So the two ideas I've been talking about today are, do you know where you're going to? And can you feel the music? You need to be able to describe where you're going to so your team can see it clearly. And you need to feel the music to connect with them emotionally so they'll want to go there with you. And that's how you can bring lasting change to your team. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to taking some of your questions. Welcome back, Aaron. Let's, uh, let's bring some of these questions and start to have a conversation. Aaron, you might need to unmute. I'm sure I'm thinking you're on mute there, mate. Uh, I was talking to myself. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, feel I can the hear you. Groove, feel the groove. I, I mean, I understand that as somebody who's in, um, who's in music, uh, perfectly understand that. And we talk a lot about playing in the pocket, playing in the pocket. Yeah. Um, hey, guys, if that was, I mean, there was so much, there was so much to pick out. Let me just quickly pick out some of the things, some of our, our listeners. Integrity is a behavior based trait traits that we can cultivate over time. We make decisions based on our emotions and justify those decisions by our logic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's always it's always funny when John Maxwell says that a leader, a leader with no followers simply taking a walk. <laughs> <laughs> Genuine ethical influence starts with starts with integrity. Let me go to something you said quickly before I get into questions. So you know the question you asked around what's the difference you want to make? and what makes you different. Do you, do you mind just going into that a bit more just so that our listeners um, can walk out of today's session having that clarity as, as to what's the difference they wanna make in life and being able to actually understand um, what makes them different, what separates them, what makes them different from every other person. Yeah, so what the, the, it's, it's so useful to have these two questions right at, the, right at the heart of what you're doing as you're starting to think about your business. And it's usually something I, I ask of any new client when I'm starting to engage with them, those two questions. What's the difference you want to make and what makes you different? We then follow up with the question of, so what's your biggest leadership challenge in achieving that? But let's come back to these two questions. What's the difference you want to make? Well, for me as a leadership coach, the difference I want to make is I want to see my clients making a measurable change. I want to see them doing something differently tomorrow than that which they were doing yesterday. I want to see them moving the ball down the field continuously. I don't want to see them just learning some new stuff. I want to see the difference in black and white, in numbers, in something we can measure, not just in in a, in, a, in, in something that's 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 just uh, uh, that you think, yeah, 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 we do, we're doing much better now. No, I want to see the difference. In the, that's being made in their business now one of my one of my custom one of my customers uh, he, he said to me at the beginning of this year he said roger you the you're you're, you're you can be rest assured you're on the case for the rest of this year the board can see the difference you're making to this organization yeah. now that that is what i'm all about the 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 way i put it is this is the, the difference between teaching and helping you learn Mm -hmm. If I come into a room and teach and you understand nothing and walk out having learned nothing, then I could, I've taught, I've done my job. But if, I, if my job is to help you learn, I can teach as much as I like. And if you've learned nothing, I've not done my job. That's mm -hmm. a key difference for me as a leadership coach. I want to see that you're walking out of the room doing something differently, that your results are different. It's impacting on the quality and the quantity of your outcomes. So what's the difference you want to make? I want to see measurable change in the outcomes in, in, in the people I work with. 
And what makes you different? There are two primary things that make me different. The first has to do with the prize winning leadership, the prize winning leadership model. Um, just a little, you know, <laughs> there you go. You can get one of those on Amazon. A prize winning leadership model, which talks about a number of things. Let me just pull up and see if I can pull up a picture here. I've got one um, somewhere here. Let me just hit. Here we go. So here's a picture of the prize winning leadership model. So what makes you different is the prize winning leadership model. It starts with imagine. Do you remember we started at the beginning of the talk? Imagine, how can you imagine your dream in such a way that it inspires you to pursue that and find ways to make it become a reality? The second is influence. And we talked about influence and the need to influence people and how you can do that. In prize winning leadership, we go on to how do you interact with people effectively? Uh, how do we implement the dream? How do we actually put something in, in place? As a project manager, that's what I was doing all the time. How then do you increase? So this is about personal increase. We need to obviously, the project needs to move forward, the organization needs to move forward, but we wanna see increase in both your organization and you personally. And running right the way through it all is, is to do with INSPIRE. The I in PRIZE, it's an acronym, is inspiration. What, it's, a, it's a personally rewarding inspiration zone experience. So that's, that's, that's one of the things that makes me different. The other thing that makes me different is I was talking about working with difference makers. Thank you, yeah. So what's a difference maker? What's a difference maker? Well, I like to think the, the, the back in the 60s, um, was it 60s or 70s, a chap called um, uh, Milton Friedman came up with the idea that an organization's primary and, and top main objective is to maximize shareholder profit, nothing else. Well, I find that people today are becoming increasingly intolerant of companies without a cause. They want to see that there's more than just a profit motive going on. And so you'll remember that um, John Elkington talked about the triple bottom line, about yeah. people and planet as well as profit. It's often talked about as, as, as uh, in, in a number of different ways. Corporate social responsibility, looking at people and planet as well as profit. But I think it needs to go further than that. I think you need to have people who are passionate about a purpose that are going to pay attention to the people and planet as well as a profit. And they've got something going on, on that's a bit philanthropic that they're investing into things beyond their own theory of influence. So that's what I would define as a difference maker with those six things. They're passionate about a purpose, they're looking at people, planet, and profit, and they, they're philanthropic. That's so good. Let me, let me also just tell everybody who's listening throughout this month, it's actually a focus on leadership. I'm bringing a speaker every Monday who's going to be teaching and we're going to ask leadership questions i i just sensed it was time to equip this community and for us to begin to talk about this um great subject as leadership now i don't know if um this is your experience um um, um roger but one thing i found out is the the longer we are leaders and, and especially with a lot of the people i work with or the organizations there's always this tendency to become very complacent and and we tend to get and become more unaware of ourselves and we tend to we just tend to become more unaware and and i'm just wondering how can we begin to break out of that tendency there's have you have you come across the uh, the tuckman um, um t team uh, team mo team building model of uh, form storm norm perform yeah yeah so when, when a team gets together for the first time, they start to, uh, they, they just form, they get to know each other, they're not sure what to do. Then they get into the storm where they start to actually fall out with each other and say, well, figure out who's the funny one, who's the leader, who's the boss, who's the, you know, who's gonna make the tea. So that, that's the storm. Then you get into the norm of the organization where, where people settle down into their roles. They've got the, they figure out where their strengths are, whether other people's strengths are. And finally get, they get to the top of the circle, which is perform. But what often happens, and this is what, what you're talking to, what often happens at this point is that people start to dorm. The, the performance just starts to tail off. They've probably got the plans in place. They're, they're, they're probably working, but they've perhaps lost that, that cutting edge. They've lost, perhaps lost that drive to be doing something fresh and innovative and move, moving the ball down the field. They're probably just comfortable in the environment they find themselves in. And so, 
what would normally happen in the in the Tuckman idea is that you would make a change to, to the team in some way, introduce some change deliberately to cause oh. people to have to go through that cycle again. So you 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 start a new form, a new storm to get a new norm to get back up to perform. Often it needs an amount of change. Sometimes it's change that's introduced. We used to find this in projects when a project team had been together for a while then their performance started to fall off. It used to taper off because they were just settling into the same old, same old. They'd turn up on a Monday, they'd work through till Friday, they'd have the weekend off, and things would become regular. And what we had to do was to just shake things up a little bit and move people from this team to that team and that team to the other team, just to introduce a bit of change. Sometimes it was necessary anyway for operational reasons. Other times we just did it because it was a valuable thing to do, to introduce, that, just inject that little bit of change that encourages people to go around this cycle again and come back to performing. Wow. So, so in, in the, so th there has to be some level of self awareness, even as leaders, um, to ensure that they're able to inject that and know when to have that shift. And yeah, yeah. So. The, the other thing there, Aaron, just to think on yeah. that, is that actually a lot of leaders, a lot of leaders that I that I know, the, a lot, some leaders that I know, they, they get to a leadership position and that's where they stay. They would say, do you know what? It's lonely at the top. I'm yeah. responsible for everything. I've got all these responsibilities, all these decisions to make. What they're missing is two things. They're missing that leadership is intentional influence in the context of relationship without relationship you don't get the most effective leadership the other thing they're missing is that if they want to be performing at their most effective they need a coach they need yep. somebody who's meeting with them regularly to challenge them an accountability partner if you like somebody who's going to say did was that really your best shot was that really yeah. the best you could have done in that situation was there something you could have done differently and as time goes by they may be saying well actually is that product that you're making, is that service you're delivering still fit for purpose? Mm. Let's have a look, shall we? That's really good. That's really good. So, and that just leads me to this, because what you find out, especially in the line of work that we do, what you find out is that many of us are, are leading lives that if we, if we take a little closer look, um, these are lives we've just fallen into. Life is just happening to us. Um, <laughs> just just get going and um for many people um they studied a certain degree or course at university um people are working jobs completely unrelated to what they studied <laughs> so and and just listen to what you were saying around imagine and all that and 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 that question so my question is how do we know and down to that question of do you know where you're going how can someone who's listening how would they know how did they know how would they truly know where they are going? Uh, I think, how do, they know, how do they know where they're going to? Well, I think the, the answer is, do you have a passion about it? Do you, feel that it's, do you feel it's something you have to do? Or do you feel it's something you want to do? Because leadership is all about turning have to into want to. Influence is about turning have to into want to. It, it's the leader at the top of an organization has a slightly different approach because they the, uh, need a coach to bring come in and, and help them with that. But every leader in every organization should be checking out with their team, what is it that you love to do? Because what, I, what you should be doing with every member of your team is trying to fill their plate with the stuff they love doing and finding a different way to do the stuff that they're not quite so keen on. The stuff they're not quite so keen on, sometimes it just has to be done, doesn't it, to be honest? you have, There are some things in life you just have to get to do. But if your entire day is filled with that, it's going to be pretty monotonous. If you can try and keep filling their plate with the things they love to do, and from time to time just check, is there something we can take off your plate and give to somebody else who would and find somebody else who would love to do that? Then you've got a team that are enjoying what they're doing. They're coming to work because they want to, not because they have to. The, the, other thing, the other thing perhaps to say there, Aaron, is that when it's, it's not only is it, is it something you want to do, but is it something that's 
just outside of your comfort zone. Now, we talk a lot of it, don't we, as, as coaches, about your comfort zone and the fear barrier that surrounds your comfort zone that, that stops you and, and prevents you from, from, from really stepping out into things you'd like to do. Well, I like to talk in prize-winning leadership has this idea of your comfort zone in the heart. Outside of that is just surrounding that is your fears, your fear barrier. But outside of that is the inspiration zone. Now, what's that thing that when you close your eyes? So when I was playing bass guitar, I always wanted to play bass guitar. I just love hearing bass. I love playing bass. But I'd never actually played in a band yet, not regularly. Then I get the opportunity, and I had to face that fear barrier. The fear barrier for me was to do with my memory or my rather my forgettery. <laughs> I just... <laughs> To, to try and remember stuff for me, it just doesn't happen. It just doesn't come easily. If you want somebody to remember what's the capital city of, I don't know, um, anywhere, I, I don't know. I haven't got a clue. <laughs> Maybe I can do London for England. That, that'll do me. Um, so my, my memory for things like that, to learn a piece of music, takes a lot of time. And when I started learning to play bass, I came across that barrier that said, you know what? You're an idiot. You're gonna look at uh, all. People are gonna laugh at you. Those those in your head that say you you barmy idiot. What are you thinking of doing? And that is the fear barrier. If the thing that you really really want is the other side of that fear barrier, it's in the inspiration zone. If the attraction to reach that thing in the inspiration zone is strong enough then you can work through the fear barrier. That's why I say you need to imagine your pride, imagine your dream in such a way that it inspires you to do anything you possibly can to make that dream become a reality. Then you know where you're going to. I mean, uh, that's, let's, let's still stay around that. So why do you think, because even just listening to how you're describing um, the bass guitar and things like that. I could see someone who was passionate about something, um, had a dream when they were young. And the, everyone who's listening here definitely had childhood dreams. Why do you think many of us forget those dreams that we had in our childhood or just don't get to that point of being able to push through those dreams and, and, and still see those dreams and go after them um, even as we grow older? Well, I think there's a couple of things, really. There's when I was growing up, a couple of things that I can remember were I, I wanted to I wanted to join the RAF. Uh, the the thing I wanted to one of the one of the ideals of, of joining the RAF was being able to fly a plane. Now, it turns out my eyesight wasn't good enough. I was never, ever going to be able to be a, be, a, be a pilot in the RAF because my eyesight wasn't good enough. Now, I could have been a, a, an engineer officer. And in fact, I got offered a commission as, as to become an engineer officer after a, um, a selection board at Biggin Hill. But it really didn't, it didn't inspire me enough. The, the, the thing I really wanted had been taken away from me because of some physical defect. That can be one reason. Another was when playing the violin. I played from a very early age. I was playing in orchestras, playing solos, playing performances. And I knew, I just knew I really didn't enjoy practicing. <laughs> I, I didn't mind half an hour a day, 45 minutes a day. But by the time I'd done that, I'd had enough, really. You, I could always tell in the orchestras that I was playing in, you could tell those kids who were, who were, who were really, really focused. They, were just, they just loved what they were playing hours a day and really working hard. They got this mark under their chin. You could tell them. Got this 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 uh, this violin player mark under the chin. Yep. I never ever had one of those. <laughs> I just yeah. didn't enjoy practicing enough. It wasn't enough to get me into the inspiration zone. It was something I'd like, oh. but it just didn't. It, it just just didn't float my boat. Now sometimes it can take a while to figure out where your inspiration zone is and what those things are in the inspiration zone. And there's some great techniques that you can use. I'm sure you've used them before, just techniques to figure out where your strengths are, where your gifts are, where your life's experiences are. Listen, this is one of one really, really useful technique, really useful tip. Uh, Steve Jobs at a commencement address at Stanford University once said, you can only join the dots looking backwards. Look back over your career, over your lifetime, the things you've engaged with. Now, this can be more difficult when you're 16 than it can be when you're, when you're 56. But, hey, listen, just look back over your career, your life, and what are those things that really made you come alive? For me, 
that's what really gave me a focus for my life. And the focus was everything I've done, I've taught. From being a skating coach, I was a skating instructor as, as a teenager. I've been a cycling coach. I've taught violin, piano, keyboard, IT, project management. Uh, all, I've, I've, pretty much everything I've done, leadership, obviously, pretty much everything I've done and enjoyed and, and found, uh, found, found rewarding, I've taught. So that helped me to figure out the thing I, I really enjoy doing is helping people learn. It's not just teaching, it's helping people learn. Like that. Yeah. But then it's also what's, what's, the, what's the thing I want to teach people? Well, I, when I look around me and see the, the leaders around me, particularly in the profession, so whether it's in the, in the, the engineering profession that I, that I started my life into or whether it's in, in accountancy, whether it's in uh, whatever, whatever, the, whatever it might be, I look, I look around. In fact, I started for a while. I was spending some time with a number of pastors who they, they told me that they'd spent years learning the theology, learning the pastoral issues, accountants who spent years in accountants examinations, but they never had one day, even one hour's training on leadership. And you could see they could be just so much more effective. If only they could get a hang of, of get a hold on these principles. When I, when I was going through the, the airports as, a, as a, a, a young engineer traveling to various places around the UK and, and uh, Europe, I used to go through those airport bookshops. You know, those bookshops that have all the, 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 the yeah. books on the shelf that are just long enough to read on a flight. And they were filled with management. And then in the 90s, John Maxwell came along and all of a sudden he brought in this new theme of leadership. And for me, the light, the light bulb went on when I could figure out the difference between management and leadership is that you manage things, but you need to lead people. And that's when it really started to come alive for me. And the, so doing that exercise, just looking back over my life's history, helped me to figure out that, that there are two things that I really, that really float my boat. The first is helping people learn. And the second has to do with leadership as a topic. Do you mind if we just stay there? Because I, it was actually one of the questions that I wanted to ask, but I wasn't sure if I was going to go there. If you could just help people who are watching and listening um, to give some kind of definition between, between the differences between management, managers, and leaders. Well, there's the, the classic, isn't there, of managers do things right, but leaders do the right things. Um, in terms of... Um, in terms of the procedures, the processes, my experience tells me that effective management means getting efficient at what you do, making sure you're, you're working on things the most efficient way you can. There's been all sorts of, of uh, going back to Edwards Deming, coming through to uh, Ju uh, Joseph Duran and people like that, um, coming through to quality control, do, getting the processes absolutely honed down so you're doing the most efficient way of, of, of delivering what you need to deliver. But leadership is looking at just taking a bit of a, a bird's eye view and figuring out what, why do we want to do what we're doing? And maybe we need to figure out doing it differently. So it's a leader that was missing, in my view, it was a leader that was missing in Kodak when they had the, 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 yeah. the patent for digital photography. And they thought they, they had their processes and procedures in place for print photography. And they just oh. missed the boat completely. From having 90, over 90%, nearly 95% of all cameras, camera equipment, photography, everything, it was Kodak. Kodak was everywhere. Yep. And then they went bump. Totally bu just bump in a, in, in, in a, in a, inside of a decade because they lost sight of the thing that they were really, what they were really into was making memories. Yeah. It's right. Do you know that, that story about it? What, what, what's, what's, the, what's the purpose of a drill? It's for drilling, yep. no, it's for making holes. Yep. A drill is a hole making machine. I don't need a drill, I need a hole. <laughs> and the drill helps me to achieve that. In the same way, Kodak lost sight of the fact that we're about memories. We, 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 we want to look back on memories and, re, and re, recall what goes on uh, in, in our history. And that's what the photography helps us to do. They lost sight of that. They lost sight of the leadership of the organization and focused on the management and went bump. That's so good. Um, so what, what, why do you think, so as a coach, I'm always asking my clients, I'm um, asking people this question, what do you want? What do you want? People would love to tell you 
what has happened, what is gone on in their lives and all that stuff. And what you constantly find is many people cannot honestly answer that question of what they want. Why do many people, in your opinion, do not know what they want in life? Because essentially, that means they're not leading their own lives, right? So what, what are your thoughts around that? And how can we, with what we do, begin to help people actually honing on, on, on becoming more focused and giving more attention to what they want in life? I mean, Napoleon Hill says that your life, well, it's Napoleon Hill now, your life would always move in the direction of your most dominant thoughts. So if you're not thinking about what you want in life, then your life is actually not living, leading in any direction. What are your thoughts around that? Well, I, th I think, you know, there are a few things here. There's, um, I think some people get caught in a rut. They, they end up in a security trap. They find themselves in a secure position, in a secure job, in, with, 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 um, with commitments, and they feel, they feel that they can't break out of that. Some people, they just find that they're, they're stuck in this trap of security, that they can do what they do. If they try and do something different, they're going to take a, a pay cut and they can't afford that. So that kind of thing can, can, for a lot of people, be the, be the challenge. For other people, um, the, the story I told at the beginning about Diana Ross, she wanted to be, escape from her life of poverty by becoming a successful fashion designer. Well, she got to she got to the pinnacle. She became a a, a world renowned fashion designer. I know it's a story, but here, here's how the story unfolded. After that, was that she became she she managed to achieve her dream of breaking out of a life of poverty by becoming a successful fashion designer. But what she found was when she got there, it wasn't fulfilling. Because mm -hmm. of the way she left a, left behind her for her uh, somebody, somebody with whom she was really really close, she had to leave this guy behind. She had to break a relationship, and she pursued the goal of becoming a successful successful fashion designer. When she got to that thing that she thought she wanted, she figured out she'd left what she really wanted behind. Mm -hmm. And so often we can find ourselves in that trap that we what we thought we really really wanted. We, we, when we get there, we've left what we really wanted behind. Oh. And that talks about relationships, right? <laughs> but that leads us to relationships. So many, many, many of the folks listening, many of my clients are career people, um, working in corporate organizations and non-corporate environments. And one of the common traits um, we find or we see in current day working environments is that um, companies are very result driven, um, depending on the kind of industry you're working in. And sometimes, um, all right, so I'm, I'm just in the question. And sometimes um, these result driven companies, uh, this dog eat dog environments, are typically um, <clears throat> at the expense of relationships. So how does one thrive in such environments that focuses on results um, rather than building relationships? Well, I think there's a, a couple of answers in that, really. And I noticed Kelvin's answer, answer asked a really interesting question. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to come back to yeah, it. Could, I'll, I'll put that up and then you can. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so um, how, do you, how do you survive and thrive in a doggy dog profit-driven world? Well, that, I think, is the thing that we're finding Across the globe, people are becoming increasingly intolerant of. Mm. I came up with the de definition of difference makers because I was trying to figure out what it is that's different about the customers I like to work with and those that I really don't engage with at all. Whenever I'm engaging in a coaching and relationship, I say that it's not, it's not just about the coaching. It's all about also about the chemistry. Sometimes the chemistry works really, really well. Other times the chemistry doesn't work so well. And I found when I look back and started to analyze the, the chemistry that didn't work so well is those people who are really focused on wanting to, on, on the profit, on the profit motive. So whatever they, I was talking to a guy a few years ago, he just started a new business, a new franchise. And so I said, what is it you want to do? What do you, what's your, what's your ideal? What, 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 do, what do you want to do in life? He said, I want to make money. I want to make money, mate. That's what I want to do. Now, for some people, that's fine. That's their motive. 
And that, that if yeah. they want to pursue that, then then it, for, from my perspective, go on, fill your boots, get on with it. That's not that's not that's not something I can help you with directly. I would rather yeah. spend my time with people who want to be a difference maker. Now, that doesn't mean to say they're wrong and I'm right, or I'm wrong and they're right. What it means is that we're just in two different worlds. Uh, one of the things I use with my clients is a thing called motivational maps. And that helps us to figure out the things that really motivate them. Are you motivated by a thing called spirit, by being free to do whatever you want to do? Are you, are you motivated by um, uh, creator, which is to do with creating some something that nobody, no, nobody else has created before? Or are you in or are you are you motivated by a thing called builder, which is to do with achieving success and having the trappings of success in your life? Figure out what your motives are, the things that really go on inside. That, that and, and to be honest, motives they, they they change over the course of a lifetime. When you start out and you're in your twenties, you're just getting onto the job market, you've you've done your education, your motives are to, is to start to make a make a make a difference in the world. By the time you get to your 60s, and your 50s, 60s, 70s, you're thinking, actually, I'm going to settle down now. I want, to, I want to just make sure that everything's there for my retirement. Entirely, and in the middle, you've got all the family stuff going on. You've, you've, got, you've got mortgages to pay. You've got all this kind of stuff. People have different motives at different times, but I find that I work best with people whose motives are less focused on the money and more focused or less focused on the profit and more focused on the purpose. In fact, there was a guy who did some research um, I'm just trying to think of his name. I'll tell you his name and I remember. He, he did some research on a, a whole suite of American companies because he could access their historical data very easily. And he, what he found was that people, uh, companies that would focus on purpose made more profit than companies who focused on profit. Wow. Now, I, thought that, I thought that was remarkable. Uh, not everybody's wow. experience will be the same, but that, was, that those were his findings. Mm. So the question that we had, do you want to just put let, let me get that back up again. Yeah. There we go. How about in a case where you don't know what you want? Great question, Kelvin. I, I love that question because that's where, for a start, that's where coaches like Aaron and I can help you. We can help to bring those things out of you. The, the, the purpose of a coach, so the difference between a coach and a mentor, the purpose of a coach is to help release those things that are inside of you and bring them out. Yeah. The purpose of a mentor is to share their experiences with you and tell you how they did things and the things that worked well, the things that worked less well. The purpose of a coach is to draw those things out of you, to help you expose and give, 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 give and articulate those things that are inside that you can't quite get out. Now, I, there's some people, some, some people I've worked with, and they say, I really, really don't know what I want to do. I've, I don't have any ambition. But you know what? This person was just an encourager, the, the sort of encourager you'd never, <laughs> you'd never seen uh, uh, the likes of elsewhere. They were fantastic at encouraging people, make, helping everybody else do the best job they could possibly do. They had a fantastic ministry. They had, had, a, had a fantastic opportunity in front of them to embrace that, uh, that desire, that, that, that mission in life to encourage other people so sometimes we just need the language to get to be able to articulate what it is that's inside of us i think most of us have got that you know that feel when you think i, I know i know i know i know I just can't. it's like it's like when the the name of an author is on the tip of your tongue or when something you just can't reach it i think there are some times like that and so when you when that's your experience and you're not entirely sure what you want to do then maybe something maybe it's gonna it's gonna be somebody working along with you who could help yeah. to that and bring it out into the day, into the light of day. I guess uh, I guess another thing to really really um, add to that also is, it, especially in in, in um, coaching, we we always say when the student is ready, the teacher would appear, and and really it's it, it's when that when that individual gets to that point where they really want to when when wanting to know becomes a I must know then you go seeking you go searching so that yeah. you can actually find um and you were you were going to say something yeah so one of my I wrote a blog uh, a little while ago and the blog subtitle was I never had my best ideas Mm. And the reason for putting it that way is that I find the, the a really effective time is to get together with may, maybe some some of you if you're not quite sure what your what your passion is what your what your what drives you what excites you maybe you just need to get together with some people 
yeah. and talk about it. Just talk about your experiences. Talk about the things that have really excited you. Talk about the things that have made you come alive and just start to reflect on some of those. And that can sometimes be a very useful exercise. I, I, I think one, one, of, one of the ways I actually even see it, it's actually from scripture. Um, even Jesus himself had to ask people, who do people say I am? And yeah. sometimes that's actually just the way to find, okay, I don't know who I am. And just, just ask your people, who do you think I am? What do you think I'm good at? You yeah. know, um, for me, that was an experience um, uh, 2008. I think yeah, it was 2008. It was a bank holiday weekend like this. And I had friends over at the house. I had friends over the house for that weekend. And it just turned out to be this 26 hour long day, maybe 16 hours. We're just bantering and having having fun. And every, at some point in that conversation, everybody started to challenge one another to say, um, to say, what is it that everyone is doing? And and at some point, everybody just turned to me and say, Aaron, whatever happened to you? Whatever happened to the music we knew about, you knew with you in uni and all that kind of stuff. And this is me all trying to make money. And I was trying to get into properties and sell cars and do all that stuff. And just by having people in the house that evening, and by the time I looked around, one of them noticed that everyone in that room had been influenced at some point through my music. And that is actually how most of them found their whys and found their purpose. I knew at that point that there was something missing. And that was how I got back into music and released my first album. So which leads us, so let's talk about possibly just if someone is listening around this, Simon Sinek wrote that, uh, the author of that great book, uh, Know Your Why. And Simon Sinek is also somebody who, who speaks a lot about leadership. And he says the great leaders are not responsible for results, but should be responsible for the people. He also says the great leaders have to have that clarity of why rather than being results focused. And, and that's kind of what you are talking about. I'm just wondering if you could just spend a bit more time and just really hone in on why people should understand and know their whys and as they get into this journey of self-discovery. Yeah, no, the, the uh, Simon said at the Golden Circle, the why is at the heart of what you do. What yeah. I like to say to when people are looking at the particularly around business planning time, I ask them to do two things. I, I, I say, what can you see with your eyes closed? Oh. What can you see that's just out of reach? It's just around the corner. It's just over the horizon. It's just it's, it can't, you, you can't you can't physically see it. But what can you see with your eyes closed? Okay, and that's this is where the imagine piece comes and then what can you see with your eyes open because that's going to be the things that you can do practically to take you towards that thing that's just just be, just out of reach so i talk in prize winning leadership we talk about we talk about do something new to win your prize and the new is your next exciting win so once you've identified what your prize is it's that thing that's just out of reach, just out of sight, just over the horizon. Once you've identified your prize, it's outside of your comfort zone. It's beyond the fear barrier. Once you've identified your prize, that person oh. that's rewarding, inspiration zone experience, once you've identified that, I've, I've described the prize as being uh, an inspiring image of the future that produces yep. passion in people mm -hmm. and turns have to into want to. An inspiring image of the future that produces passion in people and turns have to into want to. So that, that's to do with what's the why. The why is that thing that you can see with your eyes closed. And then to put it into practice, you need to do things with your eyes open. The other thing I'd recommend people do, if you want to do something, just a bit of self-help, a great resource is a thing called Kazon. This is a book written by Craig Grishel. C H A Z O W N is how it's pronounced. Is how it's spelt. It's it's a, an interesting title. It's it's a, actually a Hebrew word, and when you pronounce it correctly, it's kazon apparently. And that's apart from being a really good way of clearing your throat. It's it talks. It's a Hebrew word for vision. It looks at it looks at what's your spiritual gift, what are your mm. values, and what are your life experiences. And where do those three things overlap? That is your zone. That's your vision. That's your purpose in life. A great resource. 
Hmm. That's just so good. Let's talk about values and leadership. I mean, which, which is really cool. What are your thoughts and what lights can you shed around that? Uh, in terms of values, I think I think in terms of, of, of staffing particularly, there's values and there's virtue. So values are those yeah. things that are at the heart of what you do. So you, they're, they're to do with they're to do with the values are to do with uh, chemistry. They're to do with character. They're to do with culture. They're, they're, they're things that are inside of you. If your values are aligned, when I talked earlier on, I said you can't change people's behaviour because our behaviour is based on our attitudes and emotions, which are based on our values, which are based on our beliefs. So if your values and beliefs are misaligned, then you're never going to get people working together in harmony. You, you, it's just never going to happen. So what are your what are your core values is so, so important. In terms of the Global Leadership Network, we've recently identified three core values that we hold on an individual, personal nature. There's passion, integrity, and empathy. We're passionate about what we do. We're passionate about our purpose. We're in integrity, genuine integrity, leads to the sort of influence that makes a difference. And empathy, we recognize that people are different. They have different strengths, different aptitudes, yep. different ways of working. And if we, can, we can, if we can learn to stand in each other's shoes and just see the world from somebody else's perspective from time to time, that's just going to help us all get along and understand the, the 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 way we like to work it's it, when you went without without empathy you think what are you doing you idiot that's obviously the wrong thing to do the wrong way of doing it but if you've got empathy you can see i can i can understand why that would be the way you'd want to do it and i can understand why that's valuable to you so if we can passion integrity and empathy are the, are the three core values for each one of us so values and virtues values um jim jim um, jim collins talked about Getting the right people about get the right people on the bus, and then get them on the right seat on the bus. Get the right people on the bus is all to do with values. It's culture, character, chemistry. It's those things that make people really passionate about the mission that you're on. Then you need to look at the virtues, the strengths, the capabilities, and there are three things there we need to look at. We need to look at: Do you understand what's involved in doing this uh -huh. thing? Can you do you have the capability? Do you have the capacity to do it? But particularly, do you have the capability to do it? So you might understand what's involved. You might have the skills. But really, really, I can't be bothered to do that. Or, or maybe it's something that's just too demanding for you. Maybe it's something that, yeah. that when you try and engage with it, you haven't got the physical capacity. I was talking to a who was I talking to recently who said that he started to do to, to do one. Oh, it was a the guy who who started to teach plastering. He said, "I love plastering, but I couldn't do it all day long. I couldn't be a plasterer." I, he was he's in his what forties, fifties, I think. He said, "I couldn't be a plasterer all day, but I could teach people to do plastering." Now, his but physically, he would be unable, incapable of doing that job all day long but he could certainly teach people to do that job that's something he could do and that was within his capability so think about those things the virtues and the the, the values so well your yeah, values the, virtue, and the, yeah. the values are the things that, that that get you aligned on the same page and the virtues so so the other the other value the chemistry i love this bit if, you, if you've ever seen patrick lencioni and his five dysfunctions of a team you can look at the yeah. building trust mastering conflict achieving commitment as you work your way up through that triangle, that five stages of the triangle, and that second level of, of mastering conflict, if you ha if you can't get through that that second level and get to up, up beyond that mastering conflict in a team, then you're never going to be able to work efficiently and effectively as a group. So, get what are the what are the values, and then what are the virtues? As we begin to to round up, and then I'm going to get you to talk about the prize winning leadership book itself, and and the great work you're doing with the uh, um, Global Leadership Network. Um, um, how, just in a simple question, how do we become better leaders? The simple answer to that is to be, the only person we need to be better than is me yesterday. Oh. If, if if you look if you look back to if you look back to when I when I was in the in the 90s I was a keen cyclist I was a cycling coach I was doing something like 6000 miles a year on a push bike <laughs> I was quite, I was kind of keen on cycling I was a cycling coach I did I was into racing I was time trialing 
And around that time, back in the 90s, there were no British cyclists in any of the big tours, in the in the in any of the grand tours that you get around Europe. There were no British cyclists to be seen. There were a few who were domestics, but that was it. Then along came Chris Boardman and his coach, yeah. Peter Keane. I don't know if you remember back in the day when Peter was talking about the the uh, the cumulative uh, result of, of marginal yeah. gains. That yeah. was followed up by Sir, Sir, Sir Peter Brailsford. And his techniques were then taken, adopted by like Sir Clive Woodward into the, the British cycling team and the Olympics back in the early two, 2000s. It's the accumulation of small gains. If I can just be 1% better tomorrow than I was today. And that accumulate, accumulates over the course of, of six, 12 months. The only person I'm being better than is me yesterday. But I'm just so being bad. a little bit better, moving the ball a little bit down the field every day. If I can, if I can keep working that way, then I'm, I'm, I, I, if, I'm, if I'm currently a seven, I be, can become an eight. If I'm currently yeah. a four, I can become a five. Wherever you are, you can improve your leadership skills by practice. It's rather like we talked about integrity. We can we can we can we can we can set ourselves the goal to show more integrity in everyday life, and we can work towards that goal by practicing whatever the yeah. mission is, whether it's leadership, yeah. wherever you've been. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. I mean, one of the things I always remind my clients is, if you're not going to be any better tomorrow than you are today, what do you need tomorrow for? So if you want to be a better leader, <laughs> um, then today is the day to 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 work at getting better. Um, you don't. You don't need tomorrow if you're not going to work at becoming better, better than you are today. Thank you so much, um, Roger. Let's talk about where can, where can, um, how can we get the prize winning leadership uh, book itself? And you just talk to us about some of the great things going on um, with the uh, 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 Global Leadership Network here in the UK and Ireland, that, of which I'm a part of some of the great things going on. And just let's see how people who could be keen to want to hop in on that. Over to you. Okay, so th this is the, the prize winning leadership. It's um, available available on Amazon. Uh, it is audio book and Kindle and that kind of stuff, uh, as well as paperback. It's the, that's the talk about the methodology that we're using. This is something that I've started using with a number of clients. It's the personal productivity planner. And that helps you to get a methodology to, to build into your everyday life. It, it talk, looks at what, what what's your, best year ever and then it starts to chop that down into into six months into six weeks so what are the six things you're going to do you're guaranteeing that you're going to achieve in the next six weeks what are the six things that only you can do that are going to move the ball down the field that are going to be the make have the biggest impact in your life in the next six weeks and then from those what are the six things you're going to do this week to make those six things happen in the next six weeks and then finally what are the six things you're going to do today to make those six things happen this this week, to make the six things happen this six weeks, to make the six things happen this six months. So that's a methodology I use with most of my clients. Um, the, some of them are actually do, uh, putting it across the whole organization. So there's a couple of thoughts from prize winning leadership. With the Global Leadership Network, we will be running a new series of conferences starting in October next year. But even between now and then, we're, we're putting out conferences and seminars Every, 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 pretty much every month, there's something going on. I would encourage yeah. you to think about joining up to that. It's free to sign up. Some of the events are chargeable. There's a fantastic bundle available if you want to get the annual conference plus all the weekly, all, all, the, all the monthly webinars, some of the half, half day uh, um, events that we put on. There's a fantastic bundle price. And at the moment, that's going at the, uh, I think, £79 is the annual fee. Yeah. It's currently going for £59. So you're getting. Um, 20 quid off so if you'd like to engage and have a look at that so those are some of the things we have in particular we have an event coming up later this month which is going to be really useful for church leaders it's yeah. it's going to be craig Rochelle talking with some of his team so craig runs life church and he's, he's going to be doing some events with some of his pastors uh there's there's three or four um other other, other speakers i think that's in um coming up soon anyway i have to look at yeah, the but go to glnuki.org, and you'll find all the details there. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much, Roger. I, I believe that we've, we've been greatly blessed today. We've been greatly soaked with so much wisdom. Hey, guys, you want to listen to the video over and over again? 
Um, it would definitely go on YouTube at some point. I don't know when, whenever I get, whenever I get to get it on YouTube. But until then, it will still be here, here on the Thrivers Group, and you can just come and listen and listen over and over again. Um, Roger, I want to say a big thank you. Um, thank you for coming um, here on the Thrivers Group to be uh, a blessing to us. I'm just saying we're actually on the two groups. So thanks for, yeah, people are sending their greetings, saying thanks, Roger. Thank you for being a great a great blessing to us um and we would definitely have roger come again and share maybe on some other subject or continue the subject of leadership and to everybody throughout this month we're going to be focused on leadership i have another special guest i've got all my i've got all my all my guests for this month and they're all going to be speaking leadership every monday every monday we're talking leadership here on the on the thrivers group i just think it's time to equip ourselves, um, especially as we begin to come out of this, how are we coming out of how are we coming out of the pandemic? And one of those ways is to grow in your leadership. Leaders see before others and see more than others. And this is the time to equip yourself to see before others and see more than others. All right, thanks everybody, and I, I trust you've had a good time. Until next week, Monday, we're back. We're back. So tell everybody, seven thirty every Monday. You can expect that I'll have a guest where we're going to grow together and learn. Um, somebody has a question. Question, we must know. Roger, are you awake? <laughs> yeah, you're awake yesterday. All right. Cool, cool, cool. All right. All right, bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye for now.